All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our third lecture. This is developments in Southeast Asia. Mainly, we're going to be talking about India today. Um, if you haven't watched the lectures on the developments in East Asia and the developments in Dar, Dar, Dar al Islam, you'll go. I have to go ahead and do those first because I'll be referencing those throughout the lecture today. If you've already watched those, great. If you're a student who really wants to have a good understanding of history and obviously do well on the exams, you need to be able to compare these cultures. Um, with one another. So as we're going through our study of Southeast Asia, you should be thinking, how is this similar to what we've already seen in China and Dar al Islam? And how is this different? Whenever I say compare or whenever the AP test says compare, they really do mean compare and contrast. So you should be able to compare and contrast um, all of these societies with one another. The second thing you'll need to keep in mind is the Conrad de Mars model. I'll go through it really quickly, but if you need a more in-depth um, definition of the Conrad de Mars model, you'll have to return back to our first lecture, Developments in East Asia, because it is there that I um, explain uh, and elaborate on exactly what the Conrad de Mars model is. But remember, the Conrad de Mars model is uh, concerned itself with how empires are built and then how empires fall as well. And it, the Conrad de Mars model broke it down into four steps. Uh, actually, before I go on, I think I can do this. There we go. I'll go ahead and put on some captions because uh, I saw in the my last couple of videos that sometimes I tend to mumble a little bit and that makes it difficult to understand. So I'll go ahead and have the captions down there. That should make things a little bit easier. I do apologize for not having those before. Let's go back to the Conrad de Mars model. Step one was that you had small societies that had to be brought together. Step two being that once those societies are brought together into one big collective society, they have to somehow identify with the state. That could be sharing a common religion or sharing a common language or having a common enemy something that the people have in common with the state so that way um, they will identify with the state and that way everyone will work together in order to accomplish the goals of the state instead of working against one another and getting into conflict. Um, step three um, had to do with the state providing uh, for the people. This was providing wealth or providing beautiful pieces of architecture or things that were just generally nice that made the people happy. Um, for example, the, the, the centralized societies could establish trade routes. Trade routes would bring in newfound wealth for the people, but also bring in these goods for the people as well. Uh, and goods coming from a, a long ways away. And so people would be excited about these because these are goods that they would have never seen before. In addition, the government could use taxes and tribute payments from other nations in order to pay for the construction of roads or for new mosques or for new uh, churches or houses of worship. Um, or like we saw the House of Wisdom in Dar al-Islam, the government can pay for that. So that was step three. And then step four was the collapse, mainly because uh, a society would either overexpand or it would um, start to tax the people too much and people would revolt. So we'll have to remember China, Dar al-Islam, and the Conrad de Mars model as we go through our study um, on Southeast Asia, because we'll need to be um, comparing, and we will need to be aware of the themes that are presented in the Conrad Mars model. Let's go ahead and get started. This is going to be our partner reading. We're not going to do this now, but we're going to be reading one of the most famous Hindu texts, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and so when we get to class, we'll, we'll talk more about, about this, but it is a very interesting story, and I can't wait to share it with you guys. Here's our essential questions for the day. These three essential questions are up here are the same ones they've been for the other two units. What factors contribute to the formation, expansion, and decline of nations? That's pretty much the Conrad de Mars model in one sentence. What methods do governments use to centralize their power? So we've already seen a couple of examples of this with uh, with China and with Dar al-Islam. We see the use of taxes. If you remember the jizya from Dar al-Islam, the tax that was on the Jewish and Christian minorities within the empire. If you uh, remember the tribute payments that China forced Japan and Korea to pay while uh, China was underneath the Song Dynasty. Uh, if you even uh, remember some of some of the other tactics uh, that that uh, these these societies used by um, using their taxes to build architecture uh, for the people. If uh, you re remember, kind of the the trade routes that were created to uh, bring more wealth and more power into the government, 
all of those things are methods uh, that are going to be used by governments to centralize their power. Um, and we're going to see more examples of that in our study of Southeast Asia today. And then lastly, how does the development of culture create long-term impacts? So once again, I'm setting the groundwork for what we are going to study for the rest of the year. So when I am talking about Hinduism and Islam in India, we have to remember that that is going to be a key theme throughout the entirety of our study of India. So when we get to unit eight and we're talking about anti-imperialistic movements under Mahatma Gandhi, well, um, we're going to have to remember that India for an incredibly long time has had an is it has had a significant Muslim population and a obviously significant Hindu population as well. And we'll talk in more detail about that in just a little bit. By the end of our class period, it's not the end of this lecture, but at the end of the class period, we're going to be looking at a short answer question. I'll talk about that more when we are face to face in our synchronous learning or wh whatever it is that we're calling it here in Clark County School District. Here's the quote of the day. You have a right to perform your prescribed duties. And that comes from the Bhagavad Gita. This, this should ring a few bells for you. When we talked about East Asia, we talked about Confucianism, we, we looked at filial piety. Filial piety being this idea that you, if you're a son or daughter, have a duty or a job to your elders. You are to obey your mother and father without question. And we saw that the government very much tapped into that. The government said, well, in the same way that you obey your elders, you should obey us because we are the government. You have a duty to do what we told you to do. That same idea is going to present itself in East Asia as well. So this is what we, we call Eastern ideology. And we'll be talking about Eastern ideology throughout the entirety of, of the year, especially when we get to Unit 8 at the very end of the year. We'll talk about um, the kind of collectivism and doing your job and listening to the government and how that is so much different than how the people of the Western world, namely Europe and America, view their lives and view their relation uh, with the government. So know that we're once again going to be discussing the idea of doing your duty. Um, let's go ahead and start with Hinduism. Once again, CDI up here. So this is cultural development. So we're looking at religion. We're looking at culture. Let's uh, get a few things down about Hinduism. Hinduism is one of the oldest religions, if not the oldest religion in the world. There's various founders. It was uh, very much a decentralized uh, religion. So there isn't a Jesus or a Muhammad of religion uh, of sorry of Hinduism. It's a much it's various founders. What because this religion is so decentralized, there's many different iterations of it. So there's many different types of Hinduism depending on what parts of India you happen to be in. Let's look at their beliefs here. Now, Hinduism can be polytheistic or monotheistic. Now, when I was going to school, it was all polytheistic. We, we learned that Hinduism had many, many gods and you know, hundreds, if not thousands of gods and gods for each particular little thing. Um, but later studies of Hinduism have showed that some of those, some of the ways that Hindus view their gods as uh, they view all of their gods as being separate parts of one larger God, similar to how Christianity views um, God as three parts. You have God, Jesus, and the, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's very similar to what uh, the, the Hinduism has. Instead of being three parts, it's hundreds of parts, but they're all part of the same God. So depending on your view of hu Hinduism, it could be polytheistic or monotheistic. There's a belief in reincarnation, and I'm sure you've heard of this, this term before, but if you haven't, I'll go ahead and give you a quick definition. In, in, when, you, when you die, when your body dies, yeah, it, your body is, is dead, it's no longer living, but your soul doesn't die. Instead of going up to a heaven or up to some sort of deity, it is reborn into a new body on earth. So there's this idea that you are reincarnated. You are, in, in an essence, reborn. I know this reference might not hit with all my students. I, I'm, I'm a little bit out of the loop on pop culture stuff. Um, but if you still listen to Logic, the, the rapper, that guy, um, his album, Everybody, goes into this idea of reincarnation. In reincarnation. I apologize for kind of stuttering there, um, because what he what he shows in that album is that he 
reincarnates himself. He lives all these different lives. And because he lives all these different lives, he lives as a rich man, lives as a, as a poor man, lives all these different lives, lives, he learns more about the human experience and has a better understanding of the truth and what it means to be human because he has these multiple perspectives uh, of society and of the world. That's what more or less what Hindus believe as well. The idea of reincarnation is that you get to live as a poor man, live as a rich man, live um, a, as a janitor, live as a slave, live as a prince, live all these different lives so you can have multiple perspectives on life and have a better understanding of what it means to be a human being. Now, what determines how you are going to be reincarnated? Reincarnated. I mean, is there is there a process uh, that determines if you're going to be born as a very rich prince or if you're going to be born as a slave? Well, there is a process, and it's called karma. We use we use karma in the United States as well. We talk about karma, but this was a big part of the of the Hindu culture. The idea, basic idea of karma, is that what goes around comes around. If you do good things. You have good things happen to you. You do bad things, bad things happen to you. There's an example from karma um, in my own life. So the next three or four examples I have are all going to be McDonald's related. I'm, uh, I'm feeling a little hungry when I'm uh, uh, recording this video right now. So I've been thinking about going over to McDonald's, get myself a number six. That's crispy chicken BLT um, with some fries and a Coke. Uh, because that's always my order. I'm a, I'm a man of routine. I do not change it up whatsoever. And so that has been on my mind. So all of my examples are going to be McDonald's examples. So one day I was at school and I was walking through the hallways. It was uh, just before lunchtime. So I wasn't teaching or anything like that. I was uh, um, going down and going to have my lunch. And I saw this wallet on the ground. And so seeing that no one else is going to pick it up, I picked up the wallet and I looked inside. I was trying to find an ID to see, you know, which student or what teacher dropped it so I could get it back to them. And as I am looking through the wallet, I see that there is a $100 bill in there. Now, why someone would bring a $100 bill to a school, I have no idea. You're just, you're just asking for something bad to happen when you bring that much money to school. Now, I have a choice. I could turn that wallet into the office and I could say, hey, someone lost this wallet. Can you uh, maybe find them? Or if someone comes in and says they lost the wallet, you know, hand it back to them because there's some money in it. Or I could take the $100 bill out and put it in my pocket and now I have a $100 bill. So th this dilemma is in my head. I mean, and I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, I wasn't tempted because that thought definitely ran through my head of, well, I mean, I could use $100. There's, there's a lot that I could buy with a $100 bill, but I ultimately decided to do the right thing. I left the $100 bill in there. I turned it back into the office. I told them, hey, if someone lost a, lost a wallet, you know, try to just see if this is theirs because I don't want them to be out a hundred dollars. I'm sure they actually really need that money. And that's probably why they bought it to, brought it to school. Well, after school, I hop in my car, I'm starving. So I go over to the finest restaurant in Las Vegas, McDonald's, and I go in and I order my number six, my chicken BLT with fries and a Coke. And as I'm waiting for the food, I'm just kind of staring around and the McDonald's employee comes up to me with my food. And he says, sir, um, this is going to seem a little odd, but we actually have a massive problem. You see, we, we got your chicken bale team. We got your fries. We, we got your drink and everything. But we have too many apple pies. They're, we're just overflowing with apple pies. We can't control how many apple pies are here. There's just so many. There's just a flood of apple pies. So we're going to give you two free apple pies. That's karma. I did the right thing. I turned in the $100 bill. I didn't keep it for myself. And my reward is that I got two free apple pies at McDonald's. So that's the example of karma there. And Hindus use that uh, use karma in order to determine who is going to be reborn into a good life, who is going to re re be reborn into a bad life. Um, if you're a good person, you do good things, you get reborn to be being a rich prince. If you do bad things, you're reborn as a uh, slave or as a outcast or something of that nature. There's other parts of Hinduism that I want to talk about as well, mainly Svadharma and then uh, freedom from vices. Let's start with Svadharma. Svadharma is this idea of doing your duty. This is very similar to the Confucian ideology of uh, filial piety. In order to fully understand this, let's look at 
how American culture would view a McDonald's cashier. I said, we're going with McDonald's, every example here. So McDonald's cashier and how this Eastern ideology would view a McDonald's cashier. So let's start with America because that's what we know. In America, you're a teenager, you're 16, 17 years old. Uh, your parents say, you know what? We're sick and tired of you just sticking around the house all the time, not doing anything. Get up off the couch. You're going to get a job at McDonald's and you're going to work as a cashier. And so you drag yourself over there and you start working as a cashier. You push buttons and do this and do that. Da, da, da. It's really boring. You absolutely hate it. But you are under the impression because of our culture and because of our ideology that if you work really, really hard at being a cashier, your boss is going to be impressed. And your boss is going to say, you know what? I'm promoting you to manager. And then you get to manage a McDonald's. All of a sudden, you're getting a salary. You know, no longer are you paid by the hour. You get a little, a little salary there. You maybe even get a little benefits. Because you worked hard, you moved up in the world. And that's a good thing. You work really, really hard as a manager. And your boss says, you know what? I really like you as manager. I think you're ready to own this McDonald's. And so you own your local McDonald's because you've worked really hard and you're moving up that corporate ladder. And then your boss one day says to you, you know what? You're a really good owner. I think you could go corporate. I think you could go work for the, the National McDonald's Foundation there. And so you go work for the McDonald's Foundation. You're working in corporate. You move your way up. And one day when you're like 55, 60 years old, you finally become the CEO of McDonald's. And everyone talks about your rags to riches story, how you started as just a lowly cashier, but you used your, your uh, undeniable work ethic to move all the way up and be the CEO and be one of the top 1% in the United States of America. And that we see that as a good thing. We, we love people like that. We love our rags to riches story. But that's not the way to, quote unquote, live a good life under Eastern ideo ideology. In Eastern ideology, the idea is to do your duty, to stay in your lane, if we kind of use a more negative way of looking at it. So in Eastern ideology, if you were a very, very devout Hindu, you would work as a cashier in McDonald's and you would be a really, really good cashier. You're not looking up trying to be the manager. You're not saying, well, I want to move up. No, no, no. There's other people whose job it is and whose duty it is to be manager. There's other people whose duty it is to be the CEO. That's not you. You're supposed to be the cashier. So don't try to move up through society. Just focus on doing your duty, doing your job very, very well, as best as you possibly can. And that is the major difference between Western ideology and Eastern ideology. That is the idea of Svad Harma. Do your duty to society. Don't try to step on anyone's toes, stay in your lane, do what you're supposed to do. The last one is this freedom from vices. Once again, we will use McDonald's as our example here. In the United States, we love freedom. We, we are the freedom loving country. We, we love everything about freedom. We, we take our, I got my flag up here. We take our flag. We have the freedom to wave it around. We have the freedom to play loud music. We have the freedom to do anything that we want to do at all, whenever we want. We even have the freedom to eat at McDonald's if we choose to do so. We can say, I'm going to McDonald's. I'm going three times a day. I'm going to eat McDonald's as much as I want because I live in America and I have the freedom to do that. People, very devout Hindus in the, under the Eastern ideology, would disagree with that type of freedom. They wouldn't say you have the freedom to do things. They would say you have the freedom from being controlled by your vices. For example, while we in the United States see our freedom as going to McDonald's and eating whatever it is we want, devout Hindus would say, well, no, you're not free because you're being controlled by that. Because you are obsessed with McDonald's, because you're addicted to the fries and all the salt and sugar that they put in their hamburgers and their whatever food that they, uh, they give you, you're being controlled by McDonald's. You're having these cravings for McDonald's that you can't control, so you truly aren't free. And the same thing could be said about smoking or drinking alcohol. They would say, you don't have the freedom to smoke. They would say that smoking and alcohol controls you and prevents you from having true freedom. So that is another um, idea under Eastern ideology. We're not going to get into that one too much. The main one we're going to be looking at is Svad Harma because that has implications for society that we'll be talking about this on this slide right here. This is the caste system here. 
is it necessary for you to know that this is Brahman and this is uh, the Vaisha and this is the Sutra? No. What is necessary for you to know is that the, the people in India, especially devout Hindus, they want this caste system because of their religion. Now, when you look at this caste system, this seems very, um, very strict and very intense, but also very unfair. I mean, after all, there are untouchable, untouchables. There's are sweet streakers and peasants, and they have no opportunity to move up in society. And a lot of people from a Western point of view say, well, that's a lack of religion. You are not caring about people. But that's not what very, very devout Hindus believe. The reason they believe in this caste system isn't because they lack religion, but because they are incredibly religious. They believe that everyone has to do their svadharma. Everyone has to do their duty. You're born as a peasant. You were reincarnated as a peasant. Well, you're going to be a peasant. You're reincarnated as a servant. Well, you're going to be a servant. Partially because, one, you deserve it because you must have lived a poor previous life. So this is your punishment for having lived a bad previous life. But two, you need to learn the about the point of view of a servant. You need to do that duty. You need to learn that job. That way your soul can have a better understanding of the truth. If you're born as an academic or a priest, well, hey, that's because you deserved it. You lived a good um, previous life and you need to learn the point of view of life of a priest or of an academic. So this is a very, very rigid social system in which you cannot move up or move down. If you are a servant, doesn't matter how hard you work, you're going to be a servant. Um, what we also see is that women are seen as inferior to men. So this should be ringing bells in your head or you can get the light bulb going. You should see that and you should think, hey, wait a second, Confucianism was very similar to that. And wait a second, Dar al-Islam, very similar uh, to that as well, where women are seen as inferior. So you should you should be keeping that in mind. So here's our example of the, the social system that is based on Hinduism. This is also an example of the Conrad DeMars model, uh, especially number two, um, because uh, number two says that um, the government uses religion or uses some sort of commonality in order to make the people identify with the state. This is using people's religion that they've had for thousands of years. Remember, um, Hinduism is, is created in about 1700 BCE, and the government is using this to create a social structure that um, appeals to the beliefs of Hinduism. So this is very much um, Conrad DeMar's model theme number two there. So make sure you keep that in mind. This is going to be a major topic that we'll be looking at. Whenever we look at India, here's what we need to keep in mind. South India is mainly Hindu, and that is the majority of India. Majority of India is, um, is Hindu or Hindi. Um, they believe in Hinduism. What's off the map is, uh, well, I mean, you have Northern India up here, but then Pakistan as well. So this Northern part all the way up here, including the things that are not on the map, this is going to be Islam, and these this is where Muslims are going, are going to live. We can already assume that this is going to lead to some conflicts. After all, you have two major religions, two major different ways of looking at life and looking at the truth, and they're, they're right next to one another. Clearly, there's going to be some conflict there. We're not going to talk about that conflict right now, but whenever I bring up India throughout the rest of the year, you need to be thinking southern part Hindu, northern part Muslim. The idea of the northern part being Muslim, I just want to give you a couple of examples of that or at least show you why. Um, the first one is the Delhi Sultanate right here. So when we saw Dar al-Islam, we saw that Dar al-Islam uh, extended all the way from Spain in the west all the way to northern India in the east. That northern India part, the part in the east there, that's going to be the Delhi Sultanate. What the Delhi Sultanate does is it brings Islam and centralized rule. And the Delhi Sultanate uses all the similar methods that the Song Dynasty and the Abbasid Caliphate use. They impose a tax on non-Muslims. They provide architecture. They um, grow their bureaucracy in order to have uh, more power. So what, what, what we see is, is that they bring Islam, they bring the centralized, the centralized rule. 
they're not as centralized because India had such a diverse population. So India is a little bit more decentralized than, say, the Abbasid Caliphate and the Song Dynasty. But still, what we need to know about the Delhi Sultanate bringing Islam, especially to the northern part of India. I'm going to butcher this one, but I'll give my best shot. The Vijaya Nagara. Um, this was begun by two brothers. I think that was the right way of pronouncing it. It at least spelled it correctly down here in the uh, in the uh, little closed captions here. So maybe, maybe, maybe that's uh, that's how to yeah, actually pronounce it. Um, these two brothers converted to Islam in order to move up the ranks in the Delhi Sultanate, Sultanate, but then converted back to Hindu in order to establish their own kingdom. The reason I bring this one up is I want to show you that Muslim rule is going to be in the north, Hindu rule is going to be in the south. So now you have a couple names of a couple different empires that you can associate with Muslim rule and Hindu rule respectively. Let's talk about syncretism. So when I was talking about Muslim and Hindu cultures being right next to one another, you should have been thinking, ah, this is going to be an example of syncretism. It's either going to lead to conflict or syncretism or maybe both. And so we have examples of syncretism. Remember, the syncretism is the blending of culture. That is blending of language, blending of religion, blending of traditional customs, blending of architecture, blending of anything. You throw everything in the blender, blend it all together, you get something new. First one is going to be Urdu. This is a language that combines Indian, uh, and Arabic, and then Farsi or Persian elements. What we need to know is that, look, you had the people of India had their language. The people um, uh, of the Muslim world of the Middle East had their language. When they combine with one another in northern India, hey, they're going to have a new language that uses both of those um uh, traditional customs or traditional languages. We're going to see more syncretism of languages in Unit 2 when we look at Swahili because syncretism is going to happen more and more as we get to those trade routes. Let's also talk about syncretism in architecture. So this is the Kachub Minar right here. This is a piece of architecture in India. This spire right here is a traditional Hindu type of architecture, but this dome right here is a traditional Islamic or Muslim are a piece of architecture. So both of these things are together with one another. This shows a syncretism of Hindu and Islamic culture. Math, when we talked about the House of Wisdom in the Abbasid Caliphate in Dar al-Islam, we talked about Arabic numerals. We talked about trigonometry and ge uh, geometry and all the math that was developed there. Well, where did all of that mathematical knowledge come from? It actually did not come from the House of Wisdom. It came from India. And the way it gets from India all the way to Baghdad is via trade, which is going to be our major theme in our next unit. So make sure, like I, I've mentioned trade in every single lecture so far, so you're going to have to realize that that is going to be a key and important part of this unit and of our next unit. And the last one is religion. We have the Bhakti movement, which emphasizes the devotion to the God, not to the text, and very much combined with the more traditional religions in India. I'm sorry, it combined Hinduism with the traditional religions of India. This is very similar to what the Sufis have. When we talked about Dar al-Islam, we said that Islam combined with many local traditional religions and created something new, something that kind of looked like Islam without sacrificing and getting rid of the traditional cultures. The Bhakti movement is very, very similar to that. It's just Hindu instead of Muslim. Both of those, the Sufis and the Bhakti movement, are the reasons why those religions spread so quickly, because those religions are willing to not take over local religions, but combine with traditional religions, makes more people Muslim or makes more people Hindu. So we want to keep that in mind, that those the Sufi movement and the Bhakti movement can be reasons why religions spread so quickly. In order to give you a map, here's the Delhi Sultanate right here. Um, and eventually we'll be talking about the Mughals. We'll get to them in unit three. So we'll, you know, we'll hold off on them for right now. But this part right up here, in this part in red, that is going to be a Muslim area. So you're going to get many more Muslims up here. The green part and then the part down here, that's where many of the Hindus live. And we'll talk about more about the conflicts in between those two groups when we get to Unit 3 with the Mughals. For the last slide, um, we're going to go ahead and move away from India, and we're going to talk about a couple other countries or a couple of other empires in Southeast Asia. The first one is the uh, Khmer in Cambodia. 
And we're going to see that this area here, so Cambodia right in this area here, where Cambodia is now or where Vietnam is now, just to the south of China, is going to um, have many examples of a syncretism between Hinduism and Buddhist uh, religions. And the most telling example of that syncretism is going to be Angkor Wat. Um, Angkor Wat is a Buddhist temple, but it has Hindu architecture. And we'll actually jump to the next slide right now because this is Angkor Wat right here. As you can see, these tall spires, well, that's Hindu architecture as, I, as we just saw with Qutub Minar, but it is a Buddhist temple. Um, and so we can see that that is an example of syncretism. So we want to know that in this part of the world, Hinduism and Buddhism do take a big hold um, in the minds and the hearts of the people. But the kingdom I really want to focus on is right down here in what is now Indonesia. Um, and that is the Majapah Majapahat uh, Kingdom. I think I got that right here. Uh, the uh, closed captioning didn't quite get it right. Majapahit. Nope, still not getting it. That's okay. So uh, the Majapahit Kingdom was a sea power that was based in Java. So we're talking right down here um, that had trade with India and with China. Now, as we're going to see in Unit 2, whenever there is trade, there's going to be a spread of many things like technology and customs. But religion is going to be one of those things that is transferred as well. And so this area traded with India. And so obviously there's going to be a spread of Hinduism to this part of the world. Um, we see that this, er this area, Majapahit, trades with uh, the Song Dynasty in China. So there's, oh, I'm sorry, it's going to actually be the Yuan Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty. Sorry for getting my dynasties confused there. They're going to trade with China. And so there's going to be a transfer of uh, the Buddhist religion as well. And so there's going to be many Hindu and Buddhist temples in this area of the world. What we're going to see in unit two um, is that this area will eventually be converted to uh, Islam and the Muslim religion. In fact, Indonesia, this area of the world, has the largest Muslim population in the entire world today. So we're going to see that the religion will change. And we'll talk about why that is when we get to that in our next unit. But what I really want to look at is, is the spice trade down here. I want to talk about it just briefly because then we'll be looking at it in unit four as well. So down here are these spice islands. One of the most important spices is nutmeg. Um, and and there, obviously there's other spices as well, but these spices are desired by people of India and people of China um, and people of Europe eventually as well, because they can make food taste better. They can preserve meat for longer. They just make food better. I mean, people want to eat good food and people want spices. Um, so, you know, you can make a whole lot of money if you're the one who owned the spice. The Majapahit Kingdom, what they do is they do a very good job at controlling the sea routes. So this right here is the Strait of Malacca. If you want to get over to the Spice Islands, you got to go through the Strait of Malacca. And so that leads the Majapahit to do the only logical thing and to put a little barrier right there. So they block this off with their ships and they say, hey, look, you want to get to these Spice Islands down here? You're going to have to pay us a little bit of money. It's kind of like trying to go to a baseball game or a football game. Like if you want to go in and see the game, you're going to have to pay for tickets. And that's essentially what this is. You're, you're, the Majapahit are saying you need to pay us for tickets in order to enter into the Spice Islands so you can get your spices and then get out of here. And all of these traders and travelers are more than willing to do so because people are willing to pay top dollar for these spices. So we'll see that the Majapahit are going to grow incredibly powerful because they control the sea routes. And we want to keep that theme in mind for unit four, because when we look at unit four, we're going to see that the Portuguese finally get around the southern tip of Africa and they control the sea routes of this particular area, especially in the Indian Ocean. And they become fabulously wealthy because they control the sea rocks. The Dutch are actually going to do the same thing down here as well. But we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to Unit 4. That leads us to the end of uh, this particular lecture. This is the uh, short answer question. Do not do this right now. We're going to be doing it in class. So you don't have to focus on it 
uh, for right now. Um, thank you for listening to the lecture on Southeast Asia. Please make sure you are keeping in mind that you need to be comparing all of these nations with one another. We've already gone over China. We've gone over Dar al Islam. We've gone over Southeast Asia. You should be thinking, how are these societies similar to one another? How are these societies different from one another because you're going to be able to use that type of thinking on the test and you're going to be able to score a lot of points if you can show the comparison um, and contrast between all of those societies as opposed to just listing on dates and facts and other uh, kind of low-level information.